Hello everyone, welcome today to the Social Know How Studios. I'm John Groh of Accessible Data Living and we're trying something new here with ADL. I know a lot of times when you guys call me, I'm on the phone, on email, we're texting and you're asking me for product knowledge and, exp and expertise on what we do and what we provide. Here's a better thing, something you can keep for a way, way longer, a video. Yes, we're trying out a video. We're gonna get this information out to all of you. This is just the first of many uh, with the great crew at Social Know How that have worked with ADL to develop a, a, a series of informative videos to provide you, healthcare professionals, end users, caregivers, anyone who's there to help a person with their accessibility and safety needs within their home, or within the community, public spaces. We do it all. This is what we're here to do. And today, follow us, hashtag worry less, no more. I find it that when I get involved with whomever referral source or an end user or someone looking to have modifications done to the home, that they really don't know much about accessibility. They're in this, you know, this land of unknown and it really is intimidating, it's scary. And really when it does hop in into their lives, it's an immediate, it's after a traumatic injury, uh, after finding out a, a diagnosis, which no one really you know, prepares for. But here we are today preparing you, giving you the knowledge ahead of time so that when it does happen, you got it and you can go back, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook, follow us on, on Twitter, LinkedIn, we're going to be on YouTube. These things are all going out. They're going to be on our website as well at www.myadl.ca. I'll get back to this stuff at the end of the video, but we're going to go through what first steps is product knowledge, okay? Before you actually invite me, and you, there may be a, a healthcare professional, okay? So we're going to have healthcare professional. And typically, in most occasions, the health professional who you're going to be involved with immediately is your family doctor. Secondary to this, it could be a specialist. If you've had a fracture, if you have a condition or disease, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, these are common uh, conditions that obviously affect your mobility. It could be even due to sight. So it could be anybody in terms of your eye doctor and your family doctor that have de de determined that your eyesight is now uh, de diminishing, along with your cognitive. Again, family member, uh, sorry, family doctor or a specialist who's determined that your cognitive impairment or something's happened to your family member that has developed. So you can have family doctor, specialist, and then, which I call them the gurus of the home, occupational therapists. I know I'm taking a long time to write, but I like to write neat, so deal with it. Uh, like this, the occupational therapist, their role is really to reintegrate uh, the client back into the community. Obviously within the home, making sure their home is safe, making sure they have the resources in the community they need in order to stay at home. They're very important people. We will do another uh, video all about occupational therapists. That'll come soon after this one, but we're gonna deal with product knowledge. So when you're dealing with uh, obviously determining what you need, these will be the first three types of professionals you will work with to say, okay, you know what? There's gotta be changes to your home. What are those changes? What do those changes look like? So we have common changes that you know happen. There is obviously you got you know entry, bathroom, uh, and bedroom. Those are the common changes. So we'll put it in here, right here. I'm going to say bathroom, entry, bedroom, and that's a common for all three to deal with visitability. This is a term used in the industry, visitability, I spelled that right, look at that. I passed grade three. Uh, visitability is a common term used in our industry to determine the, what are the, most, are the most common changes to the home that are required in order to feel safe or be safe. So we need to make sure we have safe entry, have an active bad bathroom that is safe for use. It is the most dangerous room in the, in the home. And obviously bedroom, you need to lay your head down at night, making sure that you have everything that can accommodate your needs for a great sleep, uh, sleep filled night. With that comes with what do we need in order to provide you a safe, safety is paramount, safe environment. So 
we're going to start off with the entry. Product knowledge tells us that if we have a zero threshold entry, you're good. You don't need any changes. You may need just a, maybe a handrail if you need to hold on to something, but zero threshold entry where there's no grade difference, where you're going straight from the driveway, directly onto a walkway, into your door, that's fantastic. You, know, you need no changes, but odds are in this country, in the housing stock that we have, you're going to need uh, some form of, of uh, modification to your home to make it safer. So we have either a ramp, railings, or both, or some form of lift, okay? Or could I actually modify put steps that are much safer? So depending on your mobility needs and the other underlying conditions that you have, one of these three types of, uh, of modifications may apply. Ramps, remember folks, it's a one to 12 ratio. So for every inch of height that you have going from the entry point of your door to the grade level, take for instance, if there's 12 inches, so for every inch, there's a foot of slope. So 12, one to 12 equals 12 feet of ramp. So don't make, make sure that you understand that. And in some cases, you will need to have a permit. So make sure you put that into your cost uh, analysis when you're preparing for this, that you may need uh, to have a permits and drawings drawn up in order to uh, implement the ramp. Railings, simple. If there's no railings to the entry point and it's really a sense of you know, maintaining your balance, and for those people who suffer from vertigo, suffer from balance issues, or even just poor endurance due to potentially having a heart attack and you're weaker, railings are always good. Make sure exterior railings that you're using something that is low maintenance. So we recommend aluminum railings. Easy to install, uh, easy to install, easy to put in. And now what we got here is an opportunity to uh, give you an environment maintenance, uh, a maintenance free uh, solution that will eliminate continuous uh, care. Let's use for example, pressure treated. You could use a pressure treated railing outside Year after year, you're going to have to clean it, have to stain it, have to seal it so it maintains its integrity. There will be breakdown. With the aluminum, there's no breakdown unless you go back into it with your car, which I can't help you at that point. But at this, with this, now you've got an aluminum railing that will satisfy your need. The last one we have is simple product, uh, for product or a modification is a lift. Now, there's there are many lift manufacturers out there. And one of the things, that, the unknown is, who do we go to? What company do we, you know, obviously uh, look for in terms of providing a lift? Now, I'm not going to go out there on record and promote one company versus the other. You know, if when you look at a lift, you're going to get, you know, obviously a lift brochure or information. Someone's going to give you specs. They're going to give you specifications of what the weight load is, what type of uh, power you need. You know, it's a 120 volt, 110. Uh, you know, what ex do you need an exterior line? Can you plug into an ex existing outlet in the garage? I'm going to say no to plug in an existing garage. Reason being is that cord now becomes a tripping hazard, and there's a possible you know if that thing comes unplugged, you are not stuck with a powerless lift. Um, Make sure you do your homework. And that homework is, what does a warranty look like? Uh, you know, can it be removed easily after the fact? What is the foundation requirement for the lift? Uh, we recommend at Accessible Daily Living that you put in a cement pad, concrete pad, based on the size of the actual lift in order to accommodate the safe install, okay? We recommend a dedicated electrical outlet, exterior outlet put in by an electrician not your carpenter, not your plumber, not your next door neighbor, with an EASA permit. That will guarantee you that the application is safe for use and it will not void the warranty of the, the lift. So this is a little more complicated in its application because it involves more homework. This is why we're here. The fact is the lift requires maintenance. You should have at least two, two times a year have it looked at. They are based on worm gear uh, application. So having the worm gears, you know, greased and maintained and checked for the battery life. Uh, the most common um, 
repair that happens on our maintenance issue that happens with the lift is the exchange of the batteries because the batteries do have a, a certain shelf life and use life. So, and they typically range anywhere between 90 to $120 uh, depending on the manufacturer. There are many manufacturers in this country that provide the service uh, and the products. We deal with many of them. Again, I'm not going to promote one without, without one over the other. Do your homework. You want to call us for more information, not a problem. Make sure that the lift will fit the wheelchair, whichever one you're using. If you're using a tilt recline versus a manual versus a power, they all matter. With a tilt recline wheelchair, they're much larger uh, in size, so you're going to require a much larger platform. Please take that in consideration. Also, if you do li live in a snow belt region, make sure that you have good covering over the lift so that if you're trying to use it to get in and out of the house in the event of an emergency, that that is covered and protected so that you can get out of the home. Most cases we do re recommend, I mean they are costly, do recommend having a secondary power source for the lift in the event of a power outage, power outage excuse me, wow, tongue tied, um, is uh, get yourself a generator. A backup generator, whether it be gas or permanently uh, you know, implemented into your existing home, is beneficial because in the event that you do need that power for your appliances, and this is a very important uh, product, if it's gonna obviously support you with your mobility, make sure that you actually look at getting a generator as well. So from the lift perspective, getting in the home, we've touched upon three key elements uh, that or products that, uh, that will satisfy you getting in and out of the home. One of the other things of getting in the home is Lighting. I'm writing this like a little kid. Lighting is very important. If you're coming in at night, you want to have something that is motion. You want to have something that will allow you to access without any need of, of activating a switch or what have you. This is very important if you're going to the back of your home. Some people don't want the lift putting in at the front of the home. They want access to the back. Well, having perimeter lighting so you can have uh, access, safe access to the rear egress and proper lighting. You're going to avoid any tripping, any falling, any, any mishaps. We don't want to get you injured. What we're doing here is we're trying to resolve a barrier. We don't want to create another one. Okay? So all you folks out there, you got this right. Safety, ramp, railings, lift, lighting. And also, if you're looking at stairs, please pay attention to your composition. Do not pick anything that is high gloss, sealed, stamped concrete, looks fantastic, but it's very bad in the winter months, very slippery when there's water on it, rain. So please look at a at, uh, at product that is untreated, has a tactile response, uh, broom finish for concrete. So concrete, very uh, standard. The reason why we provide broom, uh, broom finish is that it gives you a tactile response. Okay, folks? So we're gonna get this out of the way now. We're gonna go and we're gonna go into the interior of the home. We're gonna to go to bathrooms. Next, we're gonna get into bathrooms. So once we look at the bathroom, okay, this is the most dangerous room in the home. Danger. We're dealing with water, we're dealing with electricity, we're dealing with uh, an environment that may cause a lot of issues. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to remove a lot of those issues in terms of creating, in, and in, 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 as a result, create a safe environment. One of the aspects is, and primary, is entry. So what do we do with the entry? We widen the door. We put a, a lever handle. Doorknobs are not even fashionable anymore. And for those of you out there, lever handle, easier to move and open a door and come in. You know, get into putting in a 32 inch door minimum. Standard homes, old uh, aging housing stock in Toronto, we're in Toronto, typically anywhere between 21 to 25 inches standard bathroom doors. That is very narrow, too narrow for the use with a walker, rollator walker, or a wheelchair. So we wanna to get to a minimum of 32 if it's assisted. If we want some full clearance for someone who's self-propelling their wheelchair, 
or a walker, we want 36 inches. There are op uh, applications for a door where you can either do in-swing, out-swing, pocket door, or barn door. Each application serves its purpose based on the environment around you. Like we don't want an outswinging door if it's going to affect traffic in a hallway where if you swing the door outwards, it hits another member uh, uh, of the family or the household. In swinging door, if it doesn't interfere with the key aspects of the bathroom, obviously toilet, the sink, uh, at any given time, then that's not a problem. We typically like to offer pocket doors or barn doors we prefer barn doors simply for the sheer fact that it saves on space inside. Pocket doors do, you do require internal application with obviously components that can break. And if they do break, you're going to have to break down the drywall in order to fix it. So it does become costly. So we do like the uh, barn door application, exterior uh, brackets, exterior track system, and a slab run it back and forth. We can, we do have locks for it. We do provide an oversized door so you can't see in to get, add uh, additional privacy. So outside of the entry, what do we go to now in terms of the bathroom? We look at flooring. We want non-slip. And typically non-slip flooring is untreated. You want something with a tactile response. You want a smaller tile, more grip, more grout, more grip. Less grout, less grout lines, less grip. So think about it like a tire on a vehicle. The more lines on the tire, the more it's gonna be successful in, in bad weather, in rain, in snow, in sleet, and ice. So the same thing applies when you're putting your foot on a tile when it comes to uh, navigating a bathroom. Because if there's a little bit of water and you have an oversized tile that is 24, sorry, Oh, I'm gonna do this, 24 inches by 24 inches. That's a two by two tile. Well, our feet aren't that big. I don't know anybody who's got a size 17, 18 foot or what have you. I got a size eight and a half and that size eight and a half would end up right here dead center of that tile. And if there's water in that, if there's water in on that tile, I'm going swimming or I'm going sliding. Okay, so we have to make sure that we are giving ourselves an opportunity to apply a product that will satisfy. We want to make sure we give you an aesthetically pleasing uh, living environment, which includes your bathroom. It's a very prominent uh, room in the home. People want it to look good. And at the end of the day, the last thing we want to do is give you a good looking environment and not address the functional need. Function is key. We also want the aesthetics to be here as well, but we want you to make you safe. That's why you hired us or you want us in there. So by doing so, we will satisfy the non-slip and usually we pick a tile, porcelain, ceramic, uh, with a nice grout. Um, sealing the tile may or may not be a requirement based on the type of tile. We do prefer a rectified edge tile, which is most tiles, these are beveled. A rectified edge is like a 90 degree. So it's, right, it's, a, it's a straight edge and easier to deal with when it comes to obviously applying the grout. Uh, and getting a perfect seam. Um, also, when we're looking at the bathroom environment, is we're also looking at the fixtures. Very important. And for those of you who don't know the definition of a fixture, we're looking at toilets, we're looking at sinks, we're looking at shower handheld, shower faucets, shower, shower heads, and so on and so forth. So when we're looking at fixtures, most individuals with mobility needs that are not dependent on a wheelchair, we re recommend a right height toilet. Standard toilets are 15 inches in height, right height toilets are 17 inches. So think about it from a seating position, a lot easier to get up if there's upper extremity weakness, if there's trunk weakness, or if there's just, just to have a person more up where they're not past their 90 degree in a sitting position, so it's easier to get up. With that, we also recommend, obviously, a, a flow-wise uh, type of toilet where it's, you know, energy, uh, water, co uh, water con uh, conservation is an important aspect. So we can provide a toilet that is safe from getting on and off and two, obviously being conscious for water use. There are a lot of products out there that offer a motion, which is fantastic, which requires very little, uh, you know, activation. 
You worry about, uh, uh, obviously, the flushing and cleaning yourself with, with the toilet paper. But outside of that, the toilet, right height toilet. Or there's another term called for it. It's called comfort height. So from there, we go to the faucet and the sink. You can have many. You can put in a, a pedestal sink, a, a wall-mounted sink. You can put a vanity with a sink under mount. And we also look at faucets. Now, depending on your need, we can put in any one of, your, uh, any one of those uh, applications. Uh, individuals in a wheelchair, we do recommend either like a floating a uh, sink or a wall-mounted sink that will allow them to travel underneath with the wheelchair and be able to get as close as possible to the faucet. There are people who recommend and say, you know, dual lever, lever faucets versus a single lever, lever faucet versus a motion faucet. Well, we're in COVID, boys and girls. Now, today, with this COVID application, the touchless uh, faucets are becoming more and more popular. I think if you're a homeowner and you are allowing people to visit your home, and you're feeling that comfort, that added comfort of knowing that that person doesn't have to touch your faucet may put you at ease. In a commercial environment, I'm recommending that for anybody out there who is, has a restaurant, has a, a place of business where you want your patrons, your consumers to feel comfortable, this is an easy application, one that will make them feel comfortable and know that you've thought about them uh, ahead of time and they're uh, interaction in your environment. So touchless, I personally love the dual lever, especially when I'm dealing with individuals with a cognitive impairment. Having a single lever and knowing where, where to turn it, it may be an issue with someone who doesn't have the cognitive know-how or the, what it, we like to call it in the industry of medical rehab is executive functioning. If their executive functioning isn't up to par, them trying to realize what is hot, what is cold by a single lever may be difficult. So single lever and, and, and so a dual lever. And single lever can be used for those who feel, uh, uh, feel comfortable with the uh, application, but we do like the, the dual lever and we do like the, uh, the motion application or the touchless application. Okay, so that's what we have for the sinks and uh, things. So we have sink, we have wall mounted, pedestal, vanity. With respect to, again, the actual uh, faucet, motion, dual lever, single lever. So now, We've dealt with flooring, actually before we go there, getting in there, door widening, lever handles. We've dealt with obviously uh, the types of toilet. And just remember, just with regards to getting back to toilets, so we talk about comfort height or right height as the trade, I guess, kind of uh, the names for a higher toilet. For those of you who are in the business of doing accessible construction, Please note that if someone is using a wheelchair and they may transfer in the commode, a right height or a comfort height toilet may not be an appropriate uh, application because of the height of the commode. You may get, and I'm going to come back here, and I'm just going to give you the profile of the toilet. Please do not question my, my art form of how I do toilets. I suck at at toilet bowls and what have you. So you have your actu activator here. So now, if you have a commode chair on wheels, most of them, that they use, and you have the bottom part where, obviously, the hole is to go over the toilet, if there is a comfort height toilet with 17 inches in height, and you have this, that commode may hit the rim of, of, the, of, the, of the toilet bowl. So make sure that when you're making, putting in the application of the toilet or you're talking to whomever, or you the actual end user, that when you're doing that, that you take that in consideration. Very, very important. So from that, we've gone from faucets, we've gone from fixtures, we've gone from also the flooring and the door widening, now the shower environment. So 
There are prefabricated, uh, there is stone application that people have done. They've done exposed aggregate, uh, mosaic tiles, uh, wall tiles, but complete enclosures um, f with respect to uh, how a shower should be installed. Uh, my understanding uh, from my personal experience, we prefer to do fully tiled environments and I'll, t and I'll tell you why. You have uh, an opportunity to put in a prefabricated environment where they may or may not have the ability to have a, a grab bar installed. Grab bars are very important for those with mobility issues. And if you have a prefabricated wall base for a wall environment uh, for the shower and base, drilling through that, uh, that wall board may void the warranty of that wall board it could very well uh, avoid, and also cause a leak. And if that leak comes from a drill hole that you've created, you may not be covered with insurance, with your insurance coverage to repair any issues that come from drilling a hole. So this is one of the issues that we have with regards to putting in uh, prefabricated walls. Bases, not so much. They do come pre-sloped, which is amazing, which helps with water drainage, and they do come with a tactile response, which makes them non-slip. We prefer putting in a shower base. Let me erase this like a good teacher. Maybe I'll get an apple from you guys, a virtual apple from you guys when I uh, finish this, uh, this session. But if you, the bathroom, we want to put mosaic tiles. And these are smaller tiles. And for those of you who don't know, they're really little tiny squares or they can be octagonal in shape, round. Uh, and what that does is, again, remember that, that phrase I used before, more grout lines, more grip. The smaller the tile, and especially in the environment of, uh, in the, environment of the, the, the shower where there's water, you want to have more grip and grout lines, okay? So we're looking for smaller tiles. Wall tiles, we want a wall tile that's low maintenance. So if you can buy, a, a have put in a tile that has, that has got a finish on it or is high gloss, you can just wash down, very important. Along with that is a handheld shower wand, okay, for use from a seated position. Putting in a handheld shower wand, wand, a Bath bench, wall mounted, bath bench or seat, sorry, wall mounted or independent. Also grab bars, very important. Grab bars for those who aren't familiar, you can pick a 12 inch, you can pick an 18 inch, you can pick a 24 inch. There's also 90 degree or L shaped brackets, okay, that can go in. With this, they'll allow you to create an environment that will withstand a span of time. If your mobility is good at the age of 45, 55, and you need these changes, let's think about as you age, 60, 65, the application of these, uh, these products will allow you to enjoy and use that shower environment for a longer period of time and will not in require invasive changes. Along with that, we like to add is a shower niche. Why a shower niche? Well, the shower niche will allow us to remove any soap dishes, any type of uh, um, applied bars or whatever to hold, or components to hold, like a shower caddy to hold your toiletries. And, and it removes the pinch point. Pinch points are very bad for, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of accessibility and creating a barrier-free environment. You don't want something always knocking into your arm, causing a bruise, bothering you, what have you. So a shower niche, and for those of you who shower, who buy their, their toiletries at Costco, make sure that shower niche is nice and big, because those bottles are nice and big. So make sure you, uh, you uh, obviously look at what type of shampoo, conditioner, body wash you use so that, and even if you have like a loofah sponge for those nice ladies who like to shave your legs and what have you in the shower, have that space available so you can incorporate all of those products into that one, one page, so uh, into one space. So the shower niche is a very important product. Now, for those who, of you who've contacted me, have spoken to me about uh, one of the other aspects is enclosure. Are we gonna do glass or are we gonna do shower curtain and rod? Look, glass, 
with a glass door is a barrier. We're trying to remove barriers. We don't want to create them, especially if you're using a wheelchair, a walker, or a cane going up, or a commode. The glass enclosure with the door is a no-go. We recommend curtain, curtain rod, and how we help to keep the water in is we slope the tile and we put a shower dam at the edge of the shower entry. Like this, we've addressed water spray and keeping it in. We've obviously kept it very clean with a shower curtain and easy to use and a curtain rod to actually pull and go in. And the shower dam is collapsible with the use of a rollator, walker, wheelchair, uh, a cane. So if you step on it, it will collapse. It's rubberized and will come up and it'll give you about an inch of support that if there's any backup, it's actually gonna stay in. And really we, we slope the bathroom, to, uh, the bathroom towards the shower. And we typically at times to help out, we put in a, a, what is called a linear drain. A linear drain can be retrofitted in and give you an opportunity where it's a trough. It's got this width about it, and I'll draw it out over here, okay, where you can create this environment. And what it does, it allows you to, and it's got this grill on the top, right? And you've got your center drain, and what it is is the inside is sloped. So that the water, when it comes in, you're catching all of this area, but it's sloping things. So you actually have an added cavity in your shower environment in order to make it, in order to accept more water and keep it uh, from obviously overflowing with water and having spillage outside. So as you can see, there's a lot of information here uh, that we've gone through. Uh, a lot of information that is very vital. Uh, understanding product and knowledge. Please come back to us. This is the first step. Please let us know how we're doing. This is the first, so be very kind in your comments. We're gonna prepare more videos that are gonna be more uh, informative, give you the resources and the knowledge you need to take care of yourself, your family member. For those healthcare providers out there that are looking after uh, people and uh, the, your clients, and your patients and, and their well-being, don't hesitate in contacting us. We're here to help. We're here to provide as much information and support needed. Please follow us on Facebook, in Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. We're here to help. Follow us. Check out our Instagram pages. We're constantly putting in uh, pictures of our, our projects that we've completed. Uh, let us know how we're doing. Again, I'm John Groh of Accessible Daily Living. And please remember, worry less, no more. We're here to help.